Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the hearing number 19 within the framework of the 179th period of sessions. I would like to welcome all of you and many familiar faces and many people that are very much appreciated in this panel. My name is Antonio Rejola, the president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And we have the first vice president, Julissa Mantilla, second vice president, Flavia Piovesan, and the former president, current uh, rapporteur, Jose, Jose, Jose Joel Hernandez. Over here, we have the, the interim secretary, secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, Soledad Castilla from the Redesca, and the Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Baca. Those who are listening to us and for the panelists as well, we have interpretation and closed captions. So you will have at the bottom of the screen, you have a globe to choose the language. So anyone who is participating, uh, you can all choose your language and the different options that the platform offers. This hearing is called Moderation of Content in the Internet and Freedom of Expression in the Americas. It was called by the rapporteurship itself on our own motion in order to open up our doors and to hold such a timely conversation that is essential for the current issue of human rights in the current times, mainly at times of pandemic. We are proud to be a multilateral agency on human rights that opens these spaces for dialogue. And we are glad to know that this was very much welcomed among all the players that are currently present here from the continent. As we pointed out on a press release on February the 5th, the commission acknowledges that freedom of expression in the internet is going through a cornerstone, a cornerstone, a very important time. We are part of the public, a debate, there is misinformation, and it becomes more relevant that it, there is a need to understand the content of the internet that goes hand in hand with the standards of human rights, on human rights. This is an international challenge that impacts us all and that has both internal uh, negotiations and debates, and that will make point on the strength of the institutions. This is a starting point where we'll listen to different voices facing the challenges, the, these digital challenges. So it is a process that we called the road ahead for, um, for the Latin American and for the American dialogue that will include communication media regulations, technology platforms. The inter-American standards on freedom of expression are clear. First, the democratic side to it, then the centrality, the focus on freedom of expression for all human rights. Third, the need to protect journalism. Fourth, transparency about the decision, decision making, which has an impact on the community. The protection on the expression of vulnerable communities and the role of freedom of expression so that everyone can be accountable and that they go hand in hand with the democratic values of peaceful coexistence, respecting human rights. This is a relevant challenge, how to make internet a, a, land, a scenario that increases the freedom of expression and a pending question which the steps, the next steps to take in order not to erode the values of freedom of expression. Given the diversity of the actors that have been invited today, this hearing has been structured like this. First of all, I will give the floor on behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to the Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression from the UN, because we know and we acknowledge that we have an articulation globally in this regard. So we'll have three blocks where we hope that we will focus on the dilemmas, on the challenges about moderation of content in the internet and freedom of expression. So that would be the first block. Block number two about how content is currently being moderated in the internet, including modalities, the scope and challenges. Third block, the horizons for content moderation in the Americas. In order to ensure that all people can participate, we will ask to stick to the time, it's five minutes. I know it's not much, but it's the only possibility we have to listen to all of you. So following this order, 
will give the floor to Scott Camp, the Senior Officer of Technology from the High Commissioner on Human Rights from the UN. I don't know, before I give the floor to you, Mr. Campbell, Pedro, would you like to add anything before we start? No. Okay, okay, so I'll give the floor. I just wanted to. Okay, his connection is delayed, okay. of expression on the internet, and we look forward to, to contributing to this important work. I'm participating in this hearing in my capacity as the United Nations Senior Human Rights Officer, and must note that nothing in my comments should be construed as a waiver of the privileges and immunities of the United Nations. Our office fully shares the Commission's perception that globally, we're at an inflection point. The world's public squares are becoming fully digitalized, and we can't reverse this process. The key question that decision makers and the human rights community need to urgently ask is, how can we ensure that the digitalized public square provides an open, inclusive, and safe space for expression? When regulation impacts free speech, a great deal of care is necessary. Companies must not be left to self-regulate, while government, regula government regulations must be crafted carefully to avoid overreach and infringements on democracy. Madam President, as we understand this hearing is the start of a larger process, we would like to use this opportunity to briefly contribute some key lessons our office has learned during the recent wave of legislative developments. We'll do this in hopes of informing future discussions and also in hope that speakers later today will further elaborate on some of these points. So first, allow me to note three recurring problems that can be found in many draft laws being proposed to regulate content. First, often laws are framed around very poor definitions of what constitutes unlawful or harmful content. This is a classic problem with attempts to regulate speech. Without clarity of definitions, companies or users may be pushed to choose the seemingly safer option of censorship or self-censorship rather than face an uncertain level of risk of liability for content. Secondly, there's a clear overemphasis on takedowns and the imposition of unrealistic timelines to do so. Unrealistic expectations on companies and this binary relation with content, either it stays up or it was pulled down, greatly accelerate censorship and erroneous decisions. And thirdly, some regulations simply transfer state responsibility to companies making them the only responsible actor to adjudicate and implement restrictions on expression, bypassing justice systems, and consolidating opaque company practices. But even if there are no easy solutions or specific models for regulation of platforms, uh, the work of the UN human rights machinery points us towards six key asks that should frame debates on existing laws or those laws that are now under development. And I'll leave you now with those six key asks. First, frame all new instruments on human rights. International human rights law is the only recognized and comprehensive transnational set of rules on freedom of expression and privacy. And this should be at the heart of regulation, especially in an area where cross-border border coherence is so important. Second, focus on process rather than on content. Instead of trying to define and combat different types of speech that could be harmful, regulation should focus on platforms processes that determine whether and how content is amplified or restricted and ensure human review for complex decisions. Third, require transparency. Transparency is vital for any meaningful discussion to improve content moderation. States must require full transparency from companies in relation to the way they moderate content and share information with others. And at the same time, states must be far more transparent about their own requests made to platforms. Fourth, ensure remedies. Users of platform services should have effective opportunities to appeal against content-related content -related decisions they consider to be unfair. Companies' procedures can assist to solve immediate concerns 
but independent courts should always have the final say. Fifth, involve all stakeholders. Effective rules will not emerge from behind closed doors of companies or of governments. They need to be broadly discussed with the active participation of all. And we've also noted that this dialogue globally is often dominated only by voices uh, from North America and from Europe. We must make this a truly global discussion. Sixth, ensure attention to context. Effective content moderation is impossible without human, human review that pays attention to context. Language is very contextual and identifying threats or determining the reach of certain speakers is quite hard if there's no good understanding of the local dynamics. Madam President, these are some of the fundamental considerations that in our view should accompany this important multi-stakeholder process uh, that should lead to sustainable responses through regulation in the Americas. And we view this regional debate as particularly strategic for the world. The inter-American system includes not only diverse legal and institutional systems, but also very different types of constraints affecting civic space. So your experiences and rich jurisprudence offer us all many lessons. We trust that the discussions today and in the coming months will feed into other multi-stakeholder global debates on governance in the digital space, including at the European Union, where development of the Digital Services Act is well underway, and at the United Nations, where the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation has sparked a number of important multi-stakeholder fora aimed at creating a safer, more open, and more inclusive internet. Once again, we're very grateful for this opportunity to, to join you all, and I, I thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, ahora le voy a la palabra a... Now we will give the floor to the former Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Edison Lanza. It's a pleasure to see you now in your new capacity as the Senior Fellow of the Inter-American Dialogue. So thank you, Edison, and you have the floor. Bueno, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Gracias, Hello, good afternoon, presidenta. everyone. Thank you, Madam eh, President. Me voy a tomar un segundo para saludar a take a one minute before I start to greet the new board, the new director, and actually the three commissioners who are dear friends of mine and who are great fighters. So it's a privilege that the commission is getting edge again with all of you there. Uh, greetings to all of you and this very difficult time for mankind and for our region and the current rapporteur, Pedro Bacca, for this initiative. I think we all agree that this is a key element for the projection of freedom of expression in the future. My intervention starts by acknowledging that all the international tools for human rights, from the preamble, um, human rights of 1948, and the beginning of a world where people might enjoy any religion, any belief, and any freedom of expression. The Inter-American Commission has similar protection, and it hope, and the Declaration, the American Declaration, is precisely the perspective of mankind, of, of women and men's rights. Different articles of the Convention show this and aim at, at protecting the freedom of every single person to receive and to give information with no division of uh, nationality or means of communication. Universality is therefore shown that nobody should be discriminated again and that everyone can express themselves without the fear of getting any, any retaliation. I make this introduction because I think it is key in the topic that we are going to discuss today. Content moderation is not just a mechanism that we talk about, but it is actually a public space where, where the internet, can, where you can express yourself in the internet with no retaliation. Desarrollaron el potencial que tiene 
Uh, Some years ago, uh, the potential of the internet started being developed and the platforms as well, so that millions of people could start participating before could not participate in this world environment. And there were spaces for the control of excessive power, control on human rights, and for those groups that were typically marginalized, so as to give them a voice in the public sphere. This took place in a region as in Latin America and in the Caribbean, or even in the US, where many sectors have been excluded, and in particular in Latin America and in the Caribbean, because of an authoritarian past. Something, so this is something positive of the internet, that even amid different challenges, it is still very important, and we should prevent it from becoming a, a censorship area. Today, making thousands and millions of people get in touch brings about many challenges, and dealing with them has been difficult for the states, for the companies, and for the democratic society as such, as well as for individuals, individual people, who are vulnerated by the discourse or the rhetoric of people who, are, who want to foster discrimination or violence. I would like to focus now on the pressure that we have uh, facing freedom of expression on the internet. Some come from the states that, on behalf of national interest, foster mechanisms or regulations that seek or aim censorship of dissident voices, maybe. Uh, who are not protected by freedom of expression. Some other pressures are by interested, like um, stakeholders, who disseminate information or fake information, deliberately fake information, propaganda, or who use the internet to undermine democratic institutions, such as the public, uh, public institutions. And there is also an infodemia based on uh, gender and precisely based on child exploitation or abuses of child exploitation. And the third point is the growth of platforms, which is a growing concentration of audiences in the platforms where they share information and they share ideas and opinions among other kinds of ent entertainment that the population has the right to share. So although there is consensus about the main role of the intermediaries, there has been some concern about its functioning, mainly the, mod the content moderation rules. They are not so transparent. The business model is based on uh, the use of personal data. Um, I think that it has changed. It was like that at the beginning. But the lack of action facing some of the phenomena that I've just mentioned increased or accelerated the growth of this toxic phenomena so as to allow a more robust dialogue. And this brought to other phenomena that have an impact on the democratic development of the internet and can lead to even violent acts or to a threat to democracy, which is actually one of the main reasons or one of the main functions of freedom of expression in democracy. I would also like to point out that these platforms, of these same companies, have decided to act and, in many cases, act jointly or even joined it with a civil society, and they've managed to stop or to find some solutions, uh, for example, uh, fake or misinformation, fake information, or even, even uh, misinformation in terms of the elections or the use of personal, personal data to give wrong messages or fake messages. So just to wrap up, my brief, my brief presentation, I would like to say or to talk about how to address this phenomenon. I believe that I would like to highlight a continuity line here in international law and multilateral agencies as well are currently dealing with a complex situation.
he's breaking, mainly in the last five years in terms of freedom of expression, there have been different standards developed by means of joint declarations of rapporteurs for freedom of expression, those that preceded me and who are here now, in the last four or five years, in particular, moderation of content was a concern, and there are such references here, also in the American uh, sphere or in the inter-American domain, the reports of the rapporteurship, guidelines to address misinformation regarding the elections during the electoral processes from the digital space. That was very interesting with participation of all the stakeholders and that was approved by the OAS Permanent Council, so I believe that those are starting points. Starting points for this debate. And I welcome this, this drive, and I also welcome whatever the Commission is, I mean, this hearing by, called by the Commission to foster that. I will wrap up. Yes, please do. You're running out of time. Um, some recommendations. As a, fellow, as a fellow of the Inter-American Dialogue, these recommendations are, I mean, they represent uh, myself, my own thoughts, but this is not a stance that I'm taking in this dialogue. And this will be my final remarks. First of all, it's archaic to say that only the states should take human rights standards. We believe that the companies should also adopt those standards in order to moderate content. This is the best international con consent. Transparency in the creation of content is essential. And to try to see how they adopt new standards and to improve the measures in order to see how they operate when facing political parties or the states. The review and control mechanisms to control the content should be kept, and the legal responsibility or accountability, that's not an excuse. I mean, that's, that could not be an excuse for the lack of due diligence for the right processes to question the decisions. I'm sorry, but I have to stop you. To cut. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Madam President. Uh, just one final comment, to continue calling for these kind of spaces that are inclusive for all the parties, all the stakeholders, and that the region can actually make the most of this later on. Thank you, and I apologize for um, going over time. Thank you, Edison. I don't know that five minutes is not enough, but we need to respect time restraints. I would like to give the floor now to the president of the Inter-American Association of Press. You are on mute. Sorry, thank you, president, honorable commissioners and a special rapporteur for freedom of expression of the commission. Thank you for inviting us to this dialogue space because of this fascinating and difficult issue. Internet and new technologies requested or require a more diverse and pluralistic discussion regarding the situation of freedom of expression and press. Um, there are challenges, for example, the excess of state regulations and the new environment with private actors that could exert an excessive power. And, Taking into consideration, for example, the elimination of content posted by Donald Trump and the blockage of several uh, officials, we would like to say that we believe that uh, private companies should regulate the content. And therefore, we also believe that digital platforms should do so. But even though companies have improved their practices, they should have better accountabil accountability mechanisms and better best practices. In the case of Trump, we believe that there was an abuse of power on the side of platforms which eliminated the expressions of a public official. Uh, but we consider 
that there is the principle of accountability and that is a censorship to us. Taking into consideration the SALTA declaration, the best practices and criteria to review content and other community regulations should comply with the international inter-American standards of human rights. We should have quick and efficient mechanisms of uh, consultation for those who feel that their rights of expression have been uh, uh, suspended. Therefore, we see that platforms have not been consistent in the application of criteria in different countries. So we do not advocate for uh, an excessive number of controls, but for those demanded by law about inter-American instruments on human rights that have to do with regulations to prohibit hate speech and similar practices. We believe that there is danger and we are seeing this in several countries because there could be too many regulations or the supranational mechanisms are created that would affect the democratic mechanisms of our countries. Any restriction or sanction that affects the right to express or share information and ideas on the internet should be established uh, by law according to the considerations enshrined in the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Apart from the self-regulation of global platforms, those who feel affected by blockages, they should have access to justice within their jurisdiction in order to regulate the abuses of the platforms. In summary, we believe that in this area, in order to, to have a good balance between freedom of expression and other personal rights, we need to do the following. One, self-regulation, but uh, before state regulations. Two, self-regulation should be based on human rights standards that guarantee transparency, due process, right to defense, also to have accountability. Three, that the community regulations because of their nature should be submitted to the control of the authorities according to human rights standards. And four, that we have uh, processes or quick processes in judicial, uh, at the judicial level in order to speed up these processes. We would like to thank the commission for this space. And I would like to invite you to create a new space of dialogue and to think about the possibility of a advisory opinion uh, be, uh, presented or to submit a petition for an advisory opinion by the court. That would be a great contribution for democracy. We also would like to mention a law in Australia and a law in Europe that force uh, platforms to compensate media outlets for the contents that they produce. And this is a desire that we have in our SALTA declaration. The demand has to do with the loss on competition um, intellectual property, because we know that intellectual property is a fundamental right and is necessary for the existence of a sustainable and independent press. Thank you very much. Thank you for your intervention. Now I would like to give the floor to the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights. I would like to invite uh, its executive director, Joseph Thompson, to take the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you, President. Good afternoon, commissioners, rapporteurs, officials of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and colleagues. I would like to greet you all. And I would like to give the floor to our expert, uh, Mr. Eduardo Bertoni, has enough time to present. We would like to uh, greet uh, the new uh, board of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. 
we would like to thank this opportunity to have an interaction in this hearing. I would like also to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Eduardo Bertoni, that is the representative of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights for our regional office in South America, which is based in Montevideo, Uruguay, and also to Jorge Padilla. He is in charge of the education section of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights. We also would like to uh, express that we are at your disposal. We are an education institution and we would like to support the efforts of the Honorable Commission of Human Rights and also the efforts of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We would like to contribute to your activities. We are not formally a part of the Inter-American system, but we support the Inter-American system, especially for everything that has to do with education. And we are interested in the topic of this here, and especially because of two reasons. We will, are interested in how freedom of expression and its different forms, for example, the right to truth and the right to true and collective information could be related to regulation or not of these uh, platforms or forms of expression. And we also would like to know how misinformation is affecting electoral processes. You should remember that we have an electoral uh, center or advisory center, and we have promoted several spaces of dialogue so that uh, electoral officials can share the progress they have made, especially when it comes to agreements with technological platforms. So that the electoral body is not making an imposition, but so that there are parameters to know when a content needs to be limited or should be removed. And I think that that is something that we need to explore. My colleagues will be able to uh, speak uh, and provide you more details in this regard. Madam President, I would like to greet you all. And as I said before, in this area, and if the Commission is interested in this, any other topic, we are at your disposal for collaborating and therefore fulfill our mandate. Good afternoon. Now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Eduardo Bertoni. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. To the Executive Director of the Institute, I will be very brief because I know that we are running out of time. The Inter-American Institute has been working on technology and human rights for some time. Last year, we had a webinar on the right to privacy during the pandemic and the dangers of such a right. But I would like to focus on the topic of today's hearing, and I would like to make some specific proposals uh, because we know the general uh, things. I, would like, I won't talk about the standards of freedom of expressions because they are in the Inter-American System of Human Rights. I could go over the Declaration of Freedom of Expression and also the principles for freedom of expression of the Inter-American Commission or some judgments of the Inter-American Court. But that does not make sense because you know about them. But I would like to mention three standards that are related to uh, the topic of today's hearing. The first is a very strong standard that has been adopted after the advisory opinion number five, that is, uh, prior censorship. You may remember that when the court issued that advisory opinion, it compared uh, the system with the European system because this was not present in the European system, but it was present in the American system. Second, there are indirect ways of violating freedom of expression. This appear or was mentioned by the court after the case of Aru Hipster. And also freedom of expression uh, through its standards must be protected offline and online. 
And this is something that I would like to mention. The uh, Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression repeated this several times through its reports, but also countries in its domestic law have these regulations. For example, Argentina has the law 25032 that says that the principles of freedom of expression should, that are kept in the analog world should be kept in the digital world. Why I mentioned these three standards? Because today's topic is content moderation on the internet. And it, uh, some violations of freedom of expression can occur uh, because through, um, for example, uh, through a mechanism of censor censorship as expressed by the court in the advisory opinion number five, or also there could be a violation or an indirect violation of freedom of expression. And I think that we need to ask ourselves, and I think that this is a question for the commission, are these standards as they are being prepared, can be they applied to the digital world? Are there any changes? And to identify those changes, we need to see that in the American system, this has been already presented by the Inter-American uh, Association of Press. I think that we need to see if we can revalidate or re-study these standards uh, by the issuance of a new advisory opinion. In my work for the rapporteurship some years ago, I uh, suggested the possibility of requesting a new advisory opinion before the court. And which are the topics that should be covered? Content moderation, and this includes Two important things. One, uh, filtering of content and blockage of content. I won't start talking about the details and the difference between the two concepts. I won't talk about the types of moderation that exist. There are three types of moderation that are being practiced for a long time. One is prior or prior prior reactive or post uh, content moderation. Those are the three types that we have. And my proposal is the following. The Institute and we believe that content moderation requires a change of perspective and that requires less censorship, more expression and more expression implies technology and the role of digital education and therefore we would like to highlight what the executive director was saying, the Institute is at your disposal, at the disposal of the commission, if the commission would like to request the preparation of a new advisory opinion, we can help you with the education area or with the research area, and we could collaborate with one of the main bodies of the system. I would like to thank you uh, for this opportunity to give our views regarding this important topic. And we know that this is a topic of global importance. Thank you, Eduardo, that is also a former rapporteur for freedom of expression within the commission. I, we would like to close this section by giving the floor uh, to Augusto, that is the uh, member of the, or the director of the Ombudsman Office for Human Rights of Guatemala. Good afternoon, everybody. For me, it's an honor to be able to be at this uh, forum. Uh, the sound is breaking. Augusto, we cannot hear you. I think that Augusto is having some connectivity issues. Um, the director of the office of the ombudsman uh, is having technical issues. Sorry, I have a technical issue. Many countries in the continent do not have the regulations for uh, communication technologies. And this has created violence online. And sometimes the public debate is not exempt uh, from hate speech and um, other uh, violent speeches on the internet. Sometimes uh, many human rights defenders are attacked through different communication media. Their work is being disqualified. Their lives are threatened. And 
that uh, delegitimization is also a threat to their life. Uh, human rights defenders uh, who are women are insulted, they are stigmatized. They have suffered threats in social media and they are sometimes threatened with, social, uh, with sexual violence. We see that internet has a democratizing potential, but because of the plurality of voices and content, it should be a media for the exercise of human rights, including the guarantee to freedom of expression and political participation, especially for those who do not have access to other ways or other types of information and for their voices to be heard. We need to remember also that freedom of expression also responds to uh, hate speech and other uh, discourses that are against human rights. And those who uh, uh, promote hate speech and misinformation said that freedom of expression is a way or is an excuse to do it. And sometimes uh the contents do not take into consideration the local context and therefore we cannot apply global criteria for particular or specific situations uh human rights standards said that the judiciary should have different uh, ways of identifying these concepts it's not the same talking about freedom of expression in electoral context than in cultural activities. And it's not the same that a person uh, shares a view and, or a public official shares their view. I would like to uh, say uh, that I would like to give the floor to one of my colleagues. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. In Guatemala, we have many examples of how violence can be addressed to people through the internet. In May 2019, the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala published a report about net centers that attacked the leaders of civil society, journalists, prosecutors, and members of the commission within the framework of a corruption case. The net centers create fake accounts that create a specific rhetoric that is replicated by the rest of the accounts trying to create an imaginary with a certain goal. They created discrediting campaigns about specific cases, creating fake news and putting all this information in the cloud, which goes against the plurality of content. The prosecutor's office on human rights shares the concerns for in terms of human rights and the need to ensure human rights, specifically the freedom of expression and access to information. At the same time, we consider it is important to remember that internet companies and the social media also have responsibility in terms of human rights. So their platforms should not be used to promote a hatred, rhetoric or attack attacks on defenders. Freedom of expression also responds to those limits that were already mentioned by the, uh, by the prosecutor. We need to insist that content moderation can have a serious effect on democracy because it can also give way to censorship and to hush these dissident voices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this information and for sticking to the time. Thank you both. Both. It is very important to have this kind of uh, perspective from the agencies and from the organizations. So I thank the prosecutor and both of you for your participation. Now I will give the floor. I will let's move on to the second block. So Alexander Walden from Google, you have the floor. Thank you for being here, Alexandra. You can take the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to the Inter-American Commission for the opportunity to contribute today alongside civil society, states, think tanks, and other stakeholders. Uh, Google welcomes this initiative. My name is Alex Walden, and I lead Google's human rights program. In my role, I'm responsible for coordinating and driving the company-wide strategy on human rights. And this spans all products across all regions, and it contributes to Google's vision for, for how we see building helpful products for everyone. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, and in my time, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Google's approach to human rights and how that intersects with content-related issues. 
So first, I would like to touch on our structural approach to managing human rights issues. In everything we do, we're guided by internationally recognized human rights standards. We're committed to respecting the rights enumerated in the Universal Declaration and its implementing treaties, as well as upholding standards established under the UN Guiding Principles of Business and Human Rights, as well as the uh, Global Network Initiative Principles. These are core documents for our work. Our commitment to human rights is integrated into our governance structure, our due diligence and risk management, as well as our operational practices. Senior management oversees the implementation of the guiding principles and provides regular updates to the board of directors. So there's an extensive network of Googlers who cover specific product areas and countries and functional areas, everything from data governance to content regulation. And they're responsible for the day-to-day -day work of issue spotting and protecting users' rights. The work of the human rights program is integrated into relevant work streams and there are escalation paths to the most senior levels of, company, of the company around these issues. So now that you have a sense of how we structurally embed human rights in the company, um, I'd like to speak more specifically about the, our approach to content moderation. Broadly, the internet has been a force for creativity, learning, and access to information. At Google, supporting the free flow of ideas is core to our mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible, uh, accessible and useful. This openness has democratized how stories and whose stories get told, and it's created space for all communities to tell their own stories. So this platform that we've created has billions of users a day or every month, like YouTube. Um, and there we also see up to over 500 hours of content uploaded every minute. So we are dealing with significant volume. At the same time, we also know that those platforms may also be abused. And this is why in addition to respecting local law, we have community guidelines in place that our users have to follow. Those community guidelines set the rules of the road for what is and is not allowed on the platform. For example, one of the most complex and constantly evolving areas we deal with is hate speech. Over the last several years, we took a close look at our approach towards hateful content. We did this in consultation with many experts in subjects like violent extremism, hate, human rights, civil rights, and free expression. Based on those learnings, we made several updates to how we remove more hateful content, how we reduce borderline content, and how we raise up authoritative voices on YouTube. When it comes to enforcing our policies, we understand that robust policies must be coupled with robust enforcement as well as appeals processes. Over the past several years, we've invested heavily in machines and people to identify and remove content that violates our policies against incitement to violence and hate. We're continually seeking to improve our technical systems and the processes by which we identify illegal content. While breakthroughs in machine learning and other technology have significantly enhanced our ability to detect bad content, that technology is still unable to reliably understand important things that are often critical to determining whether or not content is illegal. For example, distinguishing between violent content um, and human rights organizations documenting human rights abuses. We've seen proposals for mandated use of these technologies, but we, see, but we feel that this would lead to overblocking of speech and access to information. This is why platforms should be encouraged to further invest in these innovations while retaining the invaluable nuance and judgment that comes with human input. I'd like to very briefly highlight two additional topics um, that relate to this important work. That's stakeholder engagement and transparency. Engaging with expert stakeholders uh, outside of the company is essential to how we approach human rights and how we approach content at the company. Regular engagement and formal consultation with civil society stakeholders help us do a few things. First, identify and prioritize potential human rights impacts. Second, get, it helps us get feedback on how well we're doing in practice. I agree. And then finally, it informs how we move forward with respect to products and policies. And last, transparency. <laughs> to Google's commitment to respect human rights. 10 years ago, we launched a transparency report and we have been iterating ever since. Um, much of that new data you can see on the YouTube transparency report in particular.
And I wanna underscore that transparency is not just about traditional transparency reporting. It's about helping users, the public regulators and policymakers understand our policies and how they work, how our products work. And so we continue to iterate on ways to help folks understand how each of those work. We've created sites like how search works and how play works and how YouTube works. And we publish long form explanations and white papers to demonstrate how we address uh, things like information integrity. Um, all of these lead to a better understanding for how we, we have a process for creating and evaluating um, our product policies. In closing, I'd like to underscore um, that our approach to content moderation is guided by human rights due diligence, by external engagement, and tools like the GNI assessment. At Google, we're always learning and seeking to improve our approach to complex content challenges. So the, the framework of human rights is a uniquely meaningful tool to help governments and companies alongside international organizations and civil society navigate the challenges of harmful content. Thank you for your time and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Alexandra. I will invite now, I'll give the floor to Pedro Les from Public Policies of Facebook for Latin America. Thank you, Mr. Les, and you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone from Facebook. We are very honored to be participating in this public hearing. We value the initiative of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and of the Secretariat of Freedom of Expression to create this dialogue with many stakeholders on critical topics such as content moderation, freedom of expression, and the improvement of the democratic debate. I would like to share how we manage content moderation in Facebook. Facebook is operating at an immense scale with 1.7 billion people connected daily and billions of publications that are shared daily in different countries, different cultures and different languages. We are supported, we are based on different bases, different guidelines that show what is accepted and what is not accepted in Facebook. We are based on international standards, including the Rabat principles. We review them constantly with experts throughout the world and with an advisory board so as to be able to strengthen them if necessary. If we need to restrict some expressions, we do it in favor of other values that are also protected by the human rights, such as dignity, security, privacy, and authenticity, taking into account principles of need and proportionality. We seek to fight against abuse that can create damage by means of hatred, violence, and misinformation. In particular, this is very important at this time of pandemic. We are working in order to reduce abuse and harassment to women, removing damaging content, and developing tools in order to find the content that violates those guidelines. We want to reach balance between allowing people to express themselves and fostering an authentic environment. When our data, independent data verificators, check the information, we can identify which is the content that they labeled as fake. In order to improve transparency in content moderation, we publish a quarterly report about those reports. There are also moderation systems, external audits, and we are committed to drafting a corporate annual report on human rights. Now, the challenge is what are the next steps? We agree with the Commission that there is an evident need of, mo of content moderation practices that may respect the main warranties and that they enrich and expand the public debate. We understand that private companies should not take so many decisions on their own. We know that we are and will be judged by our actions and not by our words. As a show of our commitment in the last six months, we've adopted the following measures. The Advisory Council of Facebook started accepting cases for review, issuing or making the first statements or recommendations of policies that we started implementing already. A few weeks ago, we mentioned our new corporate policy based on human rights, reaffirming our commitment to the main international tools, including the guiding principles about human rights of the UN, 
and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which are critical in certain situations in order to determine standards and in order to conduct our work. An example, after the coup in Myanmar, we applied those principles in order to take the perpetrators out of the platform. We also signed an agreement with the OAS to work with electoral integrity, human rights, and joint development. This year, together with other companies that are present here, Facebook launched the Safety Trust in order to create better practices in the industry, regardless of third parties, in order to ensure on our own the trust of all users. We also conducted loyalty programs that could support the activities of the rapporteur for civic activities. Our goal is that Facebook will be a space for equality, safety, dignity, and freedom of expression, where you can build systems and tools that respect human rights. We know that we still have a long road ahead of us, and there's a lot to be improved. That's why we commit to supporting the recommendations of the Commission, having this kind of informed dialogues about regulatory practices within a framework of the protection to human rights that allow us to analyze the different complexities and technical challenges, as well as concerns of all the different sectors. Thank you and congratulations to the new board. And we are here at your disposal for any further information you may need. Thank you, Pedro, for all the information and for respecting our time limits. I would like to give the floor now to the director of policy of Twitter for Latin America, Hugo Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about a topic whose treatment is essential to protect open internet. We defend open internet as a global tool that is inclusive and that promotes diversity. This architecture or this tool has promoted a social and economic development without precedence and better access to information. Uh, regarding the topic of today's hearing, we highlight the need to address this in a comprehensive way. We need to focus on the pillars of open internet, and that could lead uh, to recommendations that protect fundamental rights and freedoms. And that's why we decided to participate in these spaces. In order to protect open internet, we need a comprehensive dialogue that includes global, regional, governmental, and non-governmental actors. Uh, the information of this dialogue will lead uh, to the creation of legislation because we know there is a void and we could have uh, um, that void could lead to violations of human rights. And that also could disrupt the nature of open internet. We are also aware that technologies, technology companies should do more. And we would like to share with you what Twitter does. We would like to promote social conversation. And we have rules for Twitter to be reliable and for people to have human relationships and to have access to authentic information, the approach of Twitter is based on the framework of human rights. We understand that the challenges on content moderations are always evolving, and we consider these points, and therefore we have made the a priority the opinions of experts, of our teams, and also from the general public in order to have different perspectives in our policies. We have uh, expressed how we, uh, how world leaders should follow the uh, rules of Twitter in order to mitigate harm and also to guarantee uh, access to public information. We are also reviewing our approach in this area and we have a public consultation process to see how we, we, we should manage that. Regarding the application of our rules, we are trying uh, to apply a behavior-based approach. We are trying to see the behavior of the accounts apart from the content that they have. We use human stuff and machines for that. We also have realized that the debate on content moderation is framed uh, or is based on the elimination of content, but the discussions should also show how the content moderation process works. Uh, and not only discussing if a content should be removed or not. In the long term, the most important thing about how people find content and how 
content is distributed, it's more important that determine if it's valid or not. In Twitter, we believe that the practices of content moderation should be addressed with guidelines that recommend practices of moderation based on principles that can be applied at an international level, based on accessible mechanisms that are for all the members of the internet community. We would like also to talk about transparency. Transparency is the basis to promote a healthy dialogue and to improve the reliability and the trust of people. The rules are clear for the public and therefore we have tried to improve our ads in order to improve the compliance of our rules. The trust on transparency made Twitter prepare one of the best or the first reports on transparency in 2002. We know that we can improve our work. We need to include increase our transparency by providing our data and to have a better accountability process. In Twitter, transparency is also reflected in our products. For example, we have an open API. That is the reason why you will find reports uh, reports on content moderation that present Twitter as one of the leaders on research because the openness of our data allow for this type of research. We also need to be aware that content moderation uh, in a perfect way is impossible. Mistakes by humans or by machines are always there. And we are making all the efforts in order to improve these processes. There are many areas of improvement, but we should avoid taking solutions that are only center on the most used services. We, our decisions in the matter should focus on how to improve the processes, especially everything that has to do with remediation in order to have a better system. I also would like to talk about algorithms. We believe that it's essential that uh, users have more control on their algorithms. Twitter has made several experiments. For example, in the I search icon for users, they can change the chronological order of the posts. Also, the teams are developing a roadmap to launch our models of algorithms and so that our users know how algorithms are working. All these efforts are consistent with our desire to support all the initiatives global, all the global initiatives to have these standards. And this should go beyond defining the types of content. They should provide a global framework for the internet that protects freedom of expression. And it should include technical standards like interoperability. That inter or interoperability could help us address challenges or new challenges. In order to improve our efforts, we are financing a, short, a small team of experts and designers to have an open standard code that would promote public conversation. We call it Luster. In order to finish, I would like to appraise the global nature of this dialogue. Even though we are not here to discuss which contents should be uh, removed or not, Guaranteeing the freedom of expression on the internet requires commitments in many areas. For example, those for improving the democratic uh, discussion and also to improve digital literacy. And that's why Twitter is also working in digital literacy. We have the second edition of the OAS Twitter guidelines uh, about literacy and also security on the internet which will be published soon. And this includes consumption distribution of information in a secure and responsible way. We would like to thank this for this space and we would like to repeat our commitment to work with any of the rapporteurs to create a roadmap. We hope that you will prepare recommendations to protect freedom of expression on the internet. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. I would like to give the floor to Maria Toledo from the Wikimedia Foundation. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, everybody. The Wikimedia Foundation would like to thank the opportunity of participating in this hearing. Wikimedia is a uh, foundation that promotes uh, Wikimedia site and other sites. We uh, have a group of volunteers that contribute and build Wikipedia. 
on the knowledge and the information on the site is written and edited by that community of uh, persons. Those persons dedicated their time to promote free knowledge. That community has a decisive role in our projects in order to facilitate this change of information. When the community is not able to do that job or when they are discouraged to do so, Wikimedia cannot grow. But the community is not only, does not only build Wikipedia, but they also determine how most of the uh, content moderation process is done. This is done in the decentralized way. And we have a common commitment to knowledge. The mission of Wikipedia of collecting and developing encyclopedic information of high quality means that any content that is not relevant for that goal could be eliminated. For example, if something is out of topic and does not provide any contribution to the project. The community works quickly and with a lot of flexibility in order to guarantee that the contents that are included in the platform are of high quality. And for that, we need capacity to make decisions to remove any content that is irrelevant that is or is damaging. Mo content moderation on Wikipedia is done for several reasons. To build encyclopedic articles or papers that are uh, better or uh, true to guarantee author rights, to protect uh, bad face or to prevent bad face articles, to prevent harm to people, and also to guarantee the security of people. We are doing this through a mixed system of content moderation that is based on human review by the community, but we also have automatic tools they have been developed by the community and they help with repetitive or recurrent tasks, for example, for bad face or to apply addition filters. Content moderation is governed by several content policies that address several aspects of the project. And those policies are even more and more specific. For example, we have norms uh, for people who collaborate with the building of the platform and for example there are some rules for people or health information and we have other norms that govern the behavior of those who are members of the community as i mentioned before the community establishes the moderation content policies through a deliberation process no individual has a last word and all the decisions of moderation are subject to review because transparency is also part of the DNA of our project. The policies and guidelines of content moderation uh, expect to show the social norms in the project. The decentralized application of those norms also provides flexibility and autonomy. Uh, I listen to volunteers say this, the following content moderation depends on the context and on the policies of the platform but i need also to have critical thinking to moderate content we want to we don't want to suggest that we don't have issues volunteers in wikipedia are dedicated but they also are aggressive so we there are always controversial issues and differences. We are working together with our community to develop a new code of universal behavior so that harassment, abuse of power, and bad face additions are not acceptable. Uh, the application of the code is still pending, but we know that the community will be up to the circumstances and they will be able to apply their experience so that the norms of the platform are respected. Wikipedia is not perfect and it will be always an ongoing project because we are always adding information and knowledge. But uh, as more people participate, more will be the benefit for the community and for the world. We are at the commission's disposal to help you and to collaborate with any information that you need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amalia. Uh, we are ending section two of the discussion and we will continue with section three now. Uh, to start with this section, I would like to give the floor to Gustavo Gomez from Observacom. He will have the floor for five minutes. 
Thank you, Madam President. Obsarcom would like to uh, congratulate the Commission for this initiative. We understand the need to have standards on this topic. And I would like to congratulate Pedro Vaca for his leadership in this area. We congratulate you and we are your, at your disposal to contribute or collaborate. Having a specific standards is something that we need. It's not because we don't have other things that have been already developed. We have thematic reports by the commission. We have the standards of economic, social, cultural, environmental rapporteurship regarding companies and human rights. But this hearing shows that there is a new reality and that not only the states can affect freedom of expression on the internet, but also companies and the private sector. That creates challenges and we need to adapt, update and to have standards that could guide the discussion that is already happening in the legislative powers of our countries. We need to have a global reach because we are seeing a global discussion in this and the Americas must have an alternative proposal that is robust, that is based on the American convention. And we know that that could be a great differential in our discussion that now we are only observers. This new challenge uh, is based on several evidence. The successful development of the internet has led to the need of having intermediaries, for example, companies that provide services and apps in order for those freedom of expression rights to be uh, present, to be realized. But these companies are gatekeepers of information flows. And therefore, in some spaces, we recommend a specific legislation. For example, when these gatekeeper companies that control access to internet, I'm talking about net neutrality. Regarding the content layer, we also are living in a situation because some companies are establishing private rules of moderation that create indirect and direct restrictions to freedom of expression. For example, the removal of content or the elimination of accounts. As it has been said, there are many indirect, subtle ways of uh, affecting freedom of expression. The removal of content and the elimination of accounts is the most direct way of affecting freedom of expression. But we also need to pay attention to those indirect, subtle ways of affecting freedom of expression because they should be included in the public discussion because they have the same consequences. We also need to understand there is an excessive concentration. We don't have a problem with the design because some actors have the capacity of uh, managing information, but we have also concentrated companies. Now we have companies that can uh, do uh, information turn off. Also, they can block the account of a president in the Americas. And you have a company that can concentrate 98% of all the searches uh, made by all the people in the Americas on the internet. We need to pay attention to these issues. And in order to confirm uh, these uh, observations, pay attention, Madam President, to what has been said by the special rapporteurs of the world, including uh, Pedro Vaca. In 2019, when we had the joint declaration challenges for freedom of expression in the next decade, one of the three challenges that was mentioned there is private control as the threat to freedom of expression. They say a feature of the new digital environment is the power of companies, especially in social media and search platforms and other intermediaries on the communications because they have a big concentration power. This is the first time that we have seen this power because they can open the spaces of freedom of expression and they can close it. And self-regulation is not the only solution. It's not enough. And even though we should have better practices and self-regulation, we support that. 
but we need to think of a scenario in which there is a democratic control and that the rights of the users of the platform are protected. The good news is the civil society organizations of Latin America, for example, of Sarbacom, we are preparing a response and we would like to present that before you. It is a proposal that does not force platforms to remove contents. We don't want them to be private police of what people are posting. They, with the proposal, tries to regulate the processes, to provide procedural guarantees, to protect the freedom of expression right of users from the states and from the companies. We don't want states to pass laws so that the companies are private police officers. But we don't want to have private policies because of our own decision. So our proposed proposal includes transparency obligations, accountability over, uh, obligations, due process obligations, the right to defense obligations, among other. These are necessary conditions. They should be established by law so that we provide a response to the issues presented in this hearing, because we need to see how we adapt content moderation to Inter-American standards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. And now I'll give the floor to Karen Otero, the former Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression as well. And it's a pleasure to see you here in this forum. So Catalina, she's currently the coach of the Oversight Board. So Catalina, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank you and congratulate you, first of all, for your appointment and both co-presidents as well. I would like to um, congratulate Commissioner Joel, the, secretar the secretaries, the rapporteur of freedom of expression. It's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you. In these five minutes, I'm going to try and explain very briefly what is the model of self-regulation that you've already mentioned, the people who spoke before me, the model of an independent council for um, content moderation of Facebook and Instagram. So I'm going to talk mainly about the five most important features of this model in order to explain what it is all about. The first one, what is the goal? The goal of this model is to make Facebook and Instagram, which is actually a single company, it's one company that is huge, huge indeed, moderate content according to clear regulations that might be interpreted facing the international standards on human rights and specifically about freedom of expression. That's one of the goals of our council. The second goal, not less important, is that that content moderation will be transparent and that Facebook has to be accountable for it. And the third goal is to experience, to try, because we are doing that. We are starting something that is completely unprecedented, this autonomous model or content moderation. Now, how can we make it work? you know, so that this model can be successful. Let me talk then about the second feature that is essential. It is an independent model. What does it mean to be independent or autonomous? That it has to be articulated in such a way that it can make decisions regardless of the interests of the company. Economic interests, I mean, reputation interests, any kind of interest of the company. Now, how can we manage to build something like that, such a model? Well, while adopting, adopting the autonomous regulation models uh, by the state, like for example, the legal systems. So this council has most of the features that the judicial power has, for example, in order to wake autonomously. This means first that there are budget warranties, institutional warranties, so as not to depend on the company on anything. Two, what does it mean, this kind of warranties? That this entity will, complete, will be completely isolated, different from Facebook. This will be a legal person with a patrimony that will not be revocable. It doesn't matter, whatever happens, 
Facebook cannot have access to it and they will have the funds to continue working for six years regardless. Then the members have a fixed term for the board. Facebook has no incidents whatsoever in the removal or, I mean, at the beginning, maybe appointing the four co-presidents at the beginning, okay, but as of then, then we will choose their, I mean, they will choose the first members and they, they disappear completely from the process and they are not involved in the removal of any members. Therefore, the conditions are such so that we can work independently. If we don't do that, then that's our responsibility because the bylaws allow us to do so. Third, in addition then to the goal and to the integration that will allow us to work autonomously and unbiased, in an unbiased way. The context matters. It is essential for, con for content moderation. You cannot moderate content only with a perspective from the global north. Scott said so, some other people said so here. If we do not have a diversified, a plural participation, this will go wrong. If we do this from the perspective of the, of the noble, global north, this will go wrong. Integration, therefore, has to be diverse from a regional point of view as well as from a gender point of view, age point of view, religious point of view, political point of view. So that's one of the requirements, not only for the integration of the first 20 members, but for the second group of 20 members that will complete the whole of the 40 members. Then, in addition to being diverse, and in addition to operating autonomously and in an unbiased way, it is also important to mention its competence. What is its goal? Is it an advisory council? What is the function of such a council? First, that it can make decisions on concrete cases, emblematic cases, the most difficult cases maybe. For example, uh, if Facebook may ask the council, okay, here's this case, difficult case in terms of human rights, or cases that may have an impact, a noxious impact on people's life and damaging impact. But it's not only that, even if they are emblematic, that decision is compulsory for Facebook. So Facebook has agreed to adopting that decision compulsory. And as a matter of fact, out of the first six decisions that we made, in five, we revoked, I mean, we canceled, we went against the decision of Facebook and Facebook had to accept it. And we can also recommend policies because as we said here, this is not a binary issue. Many people have spoken about it, I agree. It's not to remove or to leave one content out of the millions and billions of content that are being moderated on the net, on the social media. It is a question of how to moderate those contents. And that's why we want to recommend policies. In some of the cases, uh, many cases actually, but in some of them, we clearly recommended Facebook to make a radical change in, in the way in which they moderate content, not only related to the content itself, but also in the manner in which it does. So, and finally, which is the legal framework, international law, human rights law. We do this and it is clearly defined in the bylaws of international human rights. So this international law will um, filtrate, will penetrate the whole of it. I know that I'm running out of time. I apologize. This is just 30 seconds more. We need to have people, participants. I mean, we have... Uh, people working with us in Facebook, and these people have been great. We've been able to work with them, even if we disagreed. But we need more people. We need external participants. Observacom, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and the Rapporteurship on Freedom of Expression are the main stakeholders and participants. I hope the rest of the companies could have this kind, this similar kind of content in order to be able to exchange knowledge with them, because that dialogue is the only thing that will lead us down the right path in order to have a great model. This is an experience, and this is an unprecedented experience, but this is the very beginning. So by means of these dialogues, 
we really are going to make this experiment that it's not enough. Probably, yes, but at least this determining will go right and we, everyone is expecting that it will succeed. Thank you so much for inviting me and I hope that we can continue this dialogue, Mr. Uh, Rapporteur and Madam President. And thank you for allowing me some extra time. Thank you, Catalina. I'm sorry I couldn't interrupt you. You were so passionate about it that I couldn't interrupt you. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll give the floor to Luis Fernando Garcia from the Network uh, of Digital Rights. Good afternoon, my name is Fernando Garcia. I am a part of the Network for Digital Rights, a civil society organization devoted to the digital rights in Mexico. First of all, I thank for this hearing and I acknowledge the importance of to have this multi-sectorial debate on the impact on human rights that is involving the main companies on the internet. The commission has been a pioneer on dealing with content moderation, such as, for example, the report on freedom of expression uh, in the internet in 2013. There were already important guidelines for this debate. However, nowadays it is even more relevant to see the leadership of the Inter-American Commission on the development of principles that ensure freedom of expression as well as other human rights, facing the power of some main actors in the internet and some state regulations that with the pretext of organizing power, they insert controls that in line, online. Because of its jurisprudence, the inter-American system is well positioned to articulate standards that may offer a different perspective to the main rhetoric that vary from the control on the digital space and the denial of the impacts or obligations in terms of human rights that the main companies of the internet have. We would like to point out some key issues to be considered in drafting the standards about content moderation. First of all, it is essential that when we address the private content moderation, we should not leave aside any principles on human rights that are already built and that my colleagues have mentioned, but consolidated the legal protection for these rights. Second, secondly, it is essential to talk about the risk of validating controls on the content online, whether it is uh, published by individuals or not. There are several examples where the regulations such as um, property rights or, for example, uh, content against of the violence has gone against the repression of public figures, cl claims or complaints of violence against women, or even losing evidence of violations to human rights. It is crucial to show the non-responsibility principle by the users. His audio is breaking, I apologize. But in case that there is a request, they should be eliminated. Fourth, it is important to point out that any self-regulation scheme or a state regulation scheme should be focused mainly on ensuring that the moderation of content conducted by the main players of the internet will be transparent and accountable. As the Santa Clara principles recommend, it is necessary to publish the transparency reports that may be more robust and that the companies might notify any content moderation done and establish the proceed the appeal procedures to change the inevitable mistakes that this implies. Also, with the goal of mitigating the conflicts of interest that come from the accumulated power by some private companies, there should be measures that force companies to move away from these decisions or that allow the revision or the review of the appeals, such as, for example, network or social media councils. Then we should also include content moderation together with the challenge that it implies for human rights, that is to say the concentration of power in some private hands. It is... Okay, his audio broke again. 
Therefore, we should consolidate the power of some of some areas of the private powers. It is essential to understand interoperability of the dominant platforms that may enable a decentralization and diversity that are essential to ensure freedom of expression and other human rights. Finally, it is very important to acknowledge as well that many of the problems that we're trying to solve by content moderation are closely related to the business model of exploitation of personal data for ads for advertising, which also implies addressing the transparency, the algorithm transparency, the use of personal data, where the Inter-American Commission can also play a very important role for the present and the future of human rights in the digital environment of the Americas. I will wrap up by celebrate by thanking you for holding this hearing and committing myself and all the rest of my colleagues to continue down this process in order to harmonize the creation of principles that will lead to greater freedom of expression from a perspective of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis Fernando, and thank you also for sticking to the time. I will give the floor now to the last speaker of this third section, Agustina del Campo from the University of Palermo. Hello, everyone, and thank you, commissioners, reporters, for calling for this hearing, for making it multi-sectorial. It is so important to see each other's faces and to make a, a true dialogue among all the stakeholders. I will focus mainly on the context uh, of this hearing and then on two or three topics where I believe that the Inter-American Commission has an important opportunity to support this process. I believe we are at a very complex time for freedom of expression at a global level. Within the activists and defenders of human rights and freedom of expression, some ask for more control and some ask for less control, for more freedom on the public debate. This dichotomy is being translated into standards or legislation that are contradictory in many of our states, not only in our region, but also at a global level. Therefore, I believe that opening such a dialogue within or in the framework of this commission becomes relevant and is very much welcomed. The commission and the rapporteur have identified a turning point in freedom of expression. I believe that there are many parts that accompany this situation, many of which are technological, but many others go beyond technology. Institutional crisis, for example, structural inequalities, polarization, even, I mean, very harsh problems that are very much uh, in, like rooted in our societies. And then the problems of technological development, automation, growing automation, greater um, possibility to monitor content and information, greater concentration of power uh, for certain platforms, as Gustavo was mentioning before during his presentation. So what I believe is important and interesting about content moderation is that Many things converge here because that's the place between the public and the private spheres. We determine the rules that will prevail over the internet, which are the processes that will be implemented for these regulations, will be the tools that will be used to apply those rules, which will be the sanctions or the enforcement of those regulations. I believe that when it comes to understanding content moderation, it's not a single model. There are community models that are more decentralized, such as Wikimedia, and some other more centralized, such as Facebook or Twitter, where the implementation models are very different. And any dialogue about content moderation should be able to include standards that are for both models, for both models of content moderation. I also believe that it is not the same to talk about 
content moderation according to which platform we are talking about or which internet layer we are thinking of. Because when you think of the 230 of the US, that applies to multiple layers in on the internet structure. I haven't heard anyone talking about a possible moderation of a, I don't know, let's say a Google store. I think the conversation was mainly focused on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Wikimedia, which are the more direct intermediaries for content rather than other kinds of intermediaries with different roles. And maybe we could think, therefore, about, I mean, what we start working now, how can it be applied or not to these other players? One of the solutions in terms of content moderation was the adoption of international standards on human rights. And one of the problems that immediately came up in 2018, that it was uh, thought of as, as a proposal, is that mm, the application is not so simple. When you analyze Article 13, for example, you think about national security. I mean, it is thought for, for states. But, from a state's perspective always. Now, same thing happens when we're talking about proportionality. So I believe that there's still some pending issues about understanding what it means to include those elements outside of the state or in order to be applied by other mechanisms which do not have the same characteristics. For example, if you hear, if you heard what Pedro said about how the rules, Facebook rules change in order to adjust to this fast changing reality and to the problems that come up in the platforms. When you think about the principle of legality, you thought about it from the point of view of a state, uh, with all the legislation power and the creation of rules, interpretation, etc. So here, there are other issues that have a, an impact on this process and that will, that I think will be taken into account. Same thing as proportionality or necessity. I also think that there is consensus, and this will be, I will wrap up with this. There is consensus about the need of transparency and minimum minimum um, conditions. I don't think that it is as clear as we would like to see the implementation of those things. I think that the Inter-American Commission has a great opportunity on these topics to provide useful standards that may contribute the to the debate, because it is not only coming up in our region, but these are global, global debates, and the Inter-American standards have something very important to contribute to this dialogue. My final remarks, I welcome this hearing and the first step that the Commission is doing so as to address this topic. I think it is essential that the Commission might define the focus by analyzing their own expertise so that it will enable them to build on their own standards and to strengthen what is necessary and to contribute from a regional perspective to the difficult challenges posed to us. Thank you. Thank you, Agustina. We are running out of time. We now would have the comments and the observations of the comments of the reporters, but we are running out of time. And in 15 minutes, we have a, another hearing. I would like to thank everybody. It's been a dialogue. We have not been able to dialogue. I, don't, I wouldn't call it a dialogue, but uh, we are starting a new process. And instead of giving the floor to my colleagues or continue talking to myself, I think that the first, the best person to let us know how we will move forward is the special rapporteur Pedro Baca. So I will give him the floor, and the other commissioners will stay, remain silent. Pedro, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I would like to talk to all those who participated in today's hearing. I think it's been an hour and a half, very intense full of a lot of information and the commission and the rapporteurship are in a listening 
position. And we would like to start a dialogue. We would like to analyze everything that has been said and then to provide feedback. And this is something that we have discussed since the very beginning of February. This is the first day of an inter-American dialogue in order to address this turning point in freedom of expression. This has been repeated several times today. We have uh, established three aspects. What can we do regarding public debate? What can we do regarding the deficit in digital participation? And what also, what can we do with the challenges on content moderation? Uh, these topics are not easy, but at the same time, uh, the conversations are not easy, but uh, our organization and the rapporteurship will be working on this. Uh, we would like to have the participation of the different sectors, and even within the Commission, we would like to contribute to those discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, everybody. There is no doubt that this is a current issue. We are seeing a dichotomy in the area of freedom of expression, and this is clear. Uh, we listen to your expertise and your views, and that is a conclusion. I would like to thank you all. Uh, we regret for not having enough time, but I'm sure that the rapporteur will meet us all again to start a dialogue. Uh, this is the starting point, so we will see each other soon. This is a topic that we need to address, especially in the current context of the pandemic. Thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon. Yeah. 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 Yeah.